Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are joining us from. We are delighted to welcome you to our webinar, Offering Hope for the Future, How HIV Vaccine Research Informed COVID-19 Vaccine Research. I am Delara Uskoop, and I am just delighted to be here with you all today, moderating and welcoming everyone and hosting our opening prayer. So I would like to invite everyone to bow their heads or close their eyes or just to have a moment of solitude. Mother, Father, God, Yahweh, we come to you humbly asking you for your mercy, God. We are in the midst of a once in a century global pandemic, COVID-19, which has devastated black and brown communities all throughout the United States and has devastated the world. It has devastated the world economically, God. It has devastated the world socially, politically, and we have lost lives, God. We just ask that you bring us out of this, God, that we see a light at the end of the tunnel and God, that we are able to give vaccines and distribute vaccines equally and equitably all across the United States, God, but also all across the world. God, we also lift our, lift our, lift our spirits towards you as we think about all the lives that have been lost to HIV AIDS, God, and all those who are, who are battling HIV. God, we ask for strength, God, and we also ask for a cure. And as we come together this morning, afternoon, or evening to talk about this kind of intersection of HIV, vaccine research and COVID-19 vaccine research, we ask God that you be our guiding light so that we can find a cure and so that we can have a world free from health disparities that are racial, health disparities that are ethnic and health disparities that are national all across the world. So God, we just ask that you join us and we just ask that you bless all those that are gathered here today, their households and all those who are going to be watching the stream afterward. We thank you for everyone that is here today, God, and we thank you for giving us life-saving treatments, science and vaccines. In Jesus' most holy name, we do pray, or in whomever's name, folks on the line may pray. We want to think about inter, being interfaith, God, so we just want to offer this offer this to you. Amen. Amin. Ashe. We thank you all for joining us for that opening prayer. Again, we're delighted to have you all here and the InterCFAR Faith and Spirituality Research Collaborative and the U.S. HIV AIDS Faith Coalition are pleased to partner and announce our joint webinar, again, Offering Hope for the Future, How HIV Vaccine Research Informed COVID-19 Vaccine Research. The purpose of this webinar is to examine HIV vaccine development and how it has informed the development of COVID-19 vaccines with an expert panel comprised of epidemiologists, public health professionals, and community leaders, we will discuss vaccine development, behavioral changes, and faith-based community perspectives around the last 40 years of HIV epi of the HIV epidemic in the United States. And without further ado, I'm delighted to begin to bring up our panelists. We have Dr. Stefan Wallace. Director of External Relations of the HIV Vaccine Trials Network and the COVID-19 Prevention Network. It is a delight to have you again, Dr. Wallace, joining us this afternoon. We're also delighted to have with us Dr. Bambi Gaddis, the Executive Director of the South Carolina HIV Council, which is doing business as the Wright Wellness Center. We're also delighted to have Deontay Damper, the NAACP's first LGBTQIA chair, the transitional specialist, Washington State Department of Corrections, and the founder of Blacks Recovering, Overcoming Trauma, Health, and Awareness, short for brother. And I have been informed that Deontay um, may be joining us a little bit later in the, in the webinar. He is having um, something has, has recently come up, so he, he may be joining us a little bit later. So I did just want to introduce him in case he is able to join. And finally, we would like to welcome our chaplain, Jimmy Leon Gibbs, the interim pastor of the Gregory Congregational UCC Church in Wilmington, North Carolina, and also a member of the National CFAR CAB Coalition. Welcome, pastor, chaplain, Jimmy Gibbs. Thank you. All right. 
So we just want to delve right into it with our discussion today. And I just want to open up with why haven't we developed an HIV vaccine? What is going on? We have this Operation Warp Speed that has happened with COVID. But what's what's going on with with HIV? Why do why don't we have right now an HIV vaccine? Well, I I can provide some historical context and let the experts really dig into it. Um, I remember at a press conference way back in 1984, um, when at the beginning of the uh, AIDS epidemic, I remember uh, our Health and Human Resources Secretary, uh, Dr. Margaret Margaret um, Heckler predicted that a vaccine would come online within two years. And now, 37 years later, we still have no vaccine. And everyone said, what's the problem then? And it wasn't the government that we threw money at it. So it wasn't the problem of lack of spending. Um, it's They deemed it as the lack of they deemed it not the lack of uh, money that was spent on the HIV virus, but they deemed it as a problem with the virus itself is so complex, also as complex as the herpes virus. But I would like to hear from the experts on that. But I just remember that um, being uh, something that stuck in my mind 37 years ago when I was a caregiver for one of my best friends who was uh, dying of AIDS. Um, during that time frame. And that stuck in my mind as a chaplain and as a minister who ministered to those um, that we lost to the um, epidemic during that time frame. Thank you for that. I'm happy to jump in as well. There are a few reasons and um, uh, my colleague just spoke to a perspective regarding one of them and that is the HIV is more complex than the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. And part of uh, how that complexity exists is one in the uh, genetic diversity. Um, there's much less genetic diversity in the SARS-CoV-2 virus than there is in HIV. Um, and often when I'm doing HIV talks, I, I sort of do this analogy where I describe that the genetic diversity amongst people, even amongst all of us that are here on this panel, is less than 1%. Whereas the genetic diversity of HIV is between 10 and 30% on average. And so that is significant. And that diversity uh, challenges our ability to find the Achilles heel in the virus. Um, the mutations create um, challenges with developing a virus that will produce the right antibodies that can bind to the virus and create the protection or block um, the virus from being able to connect to our cells, attach to our cells. So that's part of the challenge. The other challenge is, is that uh, HIV has um, an ability to hide undetected or to go undetected from our immune system. So this creates complications regarding um, having a vaccine that can reach all of the different places and, and prevent, uh, provide protection in that regard. Um, so those are a couple of the reasons. The other you know, challenge regarding um, the comparison is, is that um, if I'm being honest, I think that there's also a consideration of stigma. Um, and that is that there is a significant amount of stigma associated with uh, who um, is most at risk for HIV, who is impacted by HIV. Um, generally, it's seen as a disease that only impacts those people over there, over there, uh, hence the stigma. The other consideration is, is that um, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is seen as something that impacts everyone. There's, you don't have to have sex to do it. Um, so there has been a, a massive amount of resources and you know coordination at the federal level, at the global level to respond to COVID-19 in ways that we have not seen in HIV um, and in dollar amounts that we have not seen in HIV. So I think that this is an opportunity to uh, 
to pivot and to take lessons learned from the COVID-19 response and work to apply them to an HIV uh, vaccine response as well. Um, and if I could, uh, you know, I tend to think concrete operational. I, I'm guessing also there may, there's also people on uh, this uh, webinar who come from different levels of introduction into the science of HIV. Um, more concrete is, is one of the things that we really try to reinforce is that, you know, treatment has been so effective in the last uh, decades. Uh, we've made so many accomplishments with HIV that I think there's this, uh, I'm not going to call it HIV fatigue, but I think there's, we've, we're facing also uh, HIV disinterest, uh, especially when you talk to the common person, when I say the guy on the, the woman on the street and you say, they say, well, is HIV still a problem? Um, and so the focus that we once had on this epidemic, even though it maintains its presence, um, uh, and those of us that work in it daily realize the magnitude of it. The, the, the everyday person thinks it went somewhere and it's because of science, because we've been so proficient in creating these uh, solutions to how people treat uh, this infection and how they're living and thriving and working and, and, and living lives. Um, I think there's some confusion still that remains just basic uh, when we talk about detection versus symptoms, uh, people are still really confused about the fact that we can detect and confirm the presence of HIV so much earlier than what Dr. Wallace refers to as the final manifestation of symptoms that could potentially come seven to 10 years after the exposure and the infection. And so people are really confused about some of these timetables where with COVID, we know that we can clear the virus. A person can clear the virus compared to HIV, where it's a lifelong infection that a person must manage over time. And so, um, all of these things collectively, in addition to what uh, he has noted about stigma, uh, discrimination, uh, to be more specific, um, those individuals, women, sex workers, uh, migrants, um, um, a young gay men of color, underserved uh, or underdeveloped countries, all of these entities and individuals and people um, are not prioritized in too many in too many spaces, and so there's a, a lack of interest in in the momentum as has it's been noted. I I, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Doctor. Um, you're looking at you know who's funding the research, and if you look at who's funding the COVID uh, research, while governments and um, and philanthropic organizations around the world have lined up to invest in COVID in the COVID response. Only a handful of funders support the HIV vaccine research. And to give you a, for instance, one donor, the U.S. government accounts for a little over 80 percent of the global investment in HIV vaccines. Whereas you're looking at a huge response from the other governments funding the response to COVID. So that's a big difference when you're having the US response to HIV versus a huge government, uh, huge, na huge international response to just COVID. So I think when you put the responsibility on just the US to respond to the world's response to, to um, HIV, over the last um, 37 to 40 years, that's a lot of responsibility and a lot of work that has to come from the US to look at the global response to HIV. And um, I think that's, that's putting a lot of responsibility just on the US government, whereas it should be a international response instead of a US response. And this is where we are today. So you're exactly right. And stigma plays a lot of it.
into a lot of it, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where I've traveled, and some of the other uh, other European countries as well. Well, and I hope that we, as we have this conversation, we we interface not just the national emphasis and funding of this uh, infection, but that we also look at barriers that we are facing daily at the state level, at the county and, gov and, and local government level, because it just as you know, it can't be just the U.S. effort. It also cannot just be a governmental effort. It has to be a state investment in addressing our own health concerns. And so uh, too many times uh, local state governments sit back, they return money that's, that's sent to us to do the work. Um, in some cases, we underutilize or uh, fail to direct funds where they need to be and in communities they need to be in. Um, as, as proficiently, we don't engage certain communities. Again, back to folks who we who are most impacted are not always engaged in the conversations. Um, and so, there's a as you know, there's a need for us to orchestrate not just a national uh, emphasis um, and and upfitting of HIV vaccine research, but it also has to um, from a prevention perspective. We have to vest in what do we do until that vaccine is found. Thank you for that, Dr. Gaddis. And I I want to just remind and thank our audience members for their active participation. Feel free to comment in the chat. If you're needing some technical assistance, feel free to comment in the chat. But if you have a question that's directly related to anything the panelists are saying or something that you would like to hear them kind of discuss. Uh, please feel free to incorporate that comment into the comment feature. And what we will do is either bring that comment in uh, at the point of discussion where it's appropriate or bring it toward our just more broader discussion that we have at the end. And I do want to go to an audience question that's also related to our next discussion point on Operation Warp Speed. And that is from Eddie Givens, who asks, what can be done to access more dollar amounts to focus on these issues just mentioned by Dr. Wallace? And with that, I want to tie in our next kind of discussion question, which is now that we have the Warp Speed model, how might that help us in getting an HIV vaccine quickly? So we have Warp Speed. And then what can we do to do exactly what Dr. Wallace was speaking about earlier in terms of coordination, uh, the increase of resources, and then just this general attention and this 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 effort to uh, that 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 was kind of um that was that was a that was a part of uh, the COVID nineteen Operation Warp Speed this this massive effort to develop vaccines. I want to chime in really quickly. Um, thank you for that. Um, this conversation is really helpful uh, to hear perspectives in this way. Um, we didn't start at ground zero with the COVID-19 response. Um, we already started out uh, in the running, if you will. The, the way that we developed COVID-19 vaccines to respond to the pandemic utilized uh, tools and strategies um, that were not necessarily new that have been used um, for decades in other disease areas, specifically the mRNA vaccines. Um, I think uh, the other thing I think is really important is, you know, for the protein-based vaccines like the J&J &J and um, some of the other strategies that are being used, I, I, you know, we, we have utilized uh, the development of vaccines using these strategies for HIV. So I think what was, what was different here, um, in addition to the biology of the virus, is also the fact that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is weaker. Um, and we were able to identify its Achilles heel really quickly. And so after there's this genetic sequencing that happens in order to understand genetically how the virus moves and mutates, et cetera, and after we were able to map the genetic material of this particular virus, we were literally able to then insert it into vaccine development strategies that we have already used. So that is also part of how we were able to get here. 
so quickly, in addition to uh, the confidence that uh, the American public showed by their participation in the clinical trials that helped to move us uh, forward and help to answer the questions quickly. Um, but to the question about um, warp speed and uh, as a model and even thinking about the resources, like, so part of this is the public-private partnership that I think is a really important component that my colleagues have spoken to. And, and that is, is that the U.S. government um, you know, can't be the only uh, sponsor or funder of trials. And we need to have public-private partnerships that also reach out to uh, the public or the private sector industry uh, to support innovation in these ways. And in terms of the warp speed model, uh, this was really about the coordination, um, cross-coordination across uh, NIH institutes, across federal agencies. And I do think that this level of coordination, this level of communication, and this level of harmonization is critical uh, to move forward to respond to all of the disease issues that, that we contend with, um, HIV, cancer, uh, diabetes, et cetera. Um, so thinking about how we can continue to build off of this sort of larger macro level cross-coordination effort that's taking place, I think is really a really, really important conversation. Well, a part um, to that end, uh, I'm not sure if this is a question or statement, but I'll make a, a brief statement first. I think that politics, um, HIV has had its own political um, uh, connotations throughout the, the last 40 years. Um, I think COVID ha has that as well and has taken on a life of its own. Um, it's very, I, I'm imagining the challenge that, that we're facing as science, in science as we seek to find remedies to HIV, um, as we reflect on all the lessons learned from the development of COVID vaccine, why we struggle with the politics of how do we bring the community along in this conversation in a way that they understand it. I mean, we've already talked uh, in, in other many quarters that the, just the name Warp Speed uh, lent its visual self to people believing that unlike Dr. Wallace just referring that this is not new research, that it in fact, uh, COVID research has been going on for over a decade the general public still believes it's something they just threw together. So that's part of the challenge we're still facing. Um, I, I'm not sure that the public knows anything uh, really about how HIV vaccines, what their historical legacy has been, um, not just in the past of things that did not work well, as well as the new innovations that show promise in the vaccine, uh, HIV vaccine arena. And so I, I guess I wanna ask Dr. I don't know if it's appropriate. I wanted to ask Dr. Wallace a question around in the stages of a HIV vaccine research, um, when they talk about um, what I understand are called uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, that body of research, can you talk a little bit about that, the outcomes from studying broadly neutralizing vaccines and how they compare to previous studies that have been done? And are they promising? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll say uh, what I'll attempt to respond to that. And if I need to dive deeper, just let me know. So um, we have had the Royal We uh, HIV Vaccine Trials Network has worked in collaboration with our sister network, the HIV Prevention Trials Network, to conduct um, monoclonal uh, broadly neutralizing antibody trials. Now, part of the thinking behind this is, well, let me go back. Many, when we, most people think about getting vaccines, getting a vaccination, getting a shot, that process is called active immunization. You're directly giving something, a, a product to a person to get their immune system to respond um, and learn how to fight off the virus or you know, the disease should you come in contact with it in the future. 
However, as I mentioned before, there are challenges with doing this for HIV with HIV vaccines. In addition to the challenges that I noted before, um, there's also ensuring that we get vaccines that can um, have the right sort of immune response because not all immune responses are created the same. And we can talk about this as it relates to COVID-19 as well. Um, the other thing is, is that we also want to make sure that it goes to all of the right places. The immune response goes to all the right places from an HIV vaccine. So we have not been able to find the right combination of vaccine products to do this so far. So one of the ways, think about this as a target, like what is the target? With SARS-CoV-2, we know the target was um, the the place where the virus attaches to our, uh, our immune cells. And so- I'm sorry. The spike. The spike protein, right. Okay. So that's the Achilles heel of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. However, we've not been able to find, uh, uh, create a vaccine that will address the, the multiple Achilles heels that exist with HIV, because it's not so, just one. It's so multiple. is it that HIV? So let me, oh, okay, you let me, it, yeah, let me just add that. So monoclonal uh, or broadly neutralizing antibody research was designed as a passive immunization, a passive immunization strategy to find out instead of giving people a vaccine to see if they can develop the block infection to, you know, block uh, disease, et cetera. If we can give people the antibodies that we think would be protective and see if they actually work. So we've conducted lots of trials in this way. Some of them are still ongoing. Uh, two major ones completed um, some time ago and results were released this year that show that this particular strategy worked really well against the HIV backs, against the strains of HIV to which, which were sensitive to the antibodies. So we have uh, moved forward with uh, broadly neutralizing antibody research to continue to do other kinds of ways like combining antibodies together, um, et cetera, to, to offer potentially a better um, protective outcome. So those studies, as I mentioned, are ongoing and will have results in the future and I can certainly report back. But this is an important uh, inquiry. This is an important you know, area of research that may help to identify you know, what is the right kind of immune response that we need to see and that will help us to think about how we reverse engineer an HIV vaccine. So does this sound like, so when in basic terms, you're trying to come up with the right combination or the right, what I'll use cocktail, that is- Yeah, the goal is to come up with the right cocktail because our, our immune systems work really well to fight off disease, right? We saw this with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Like you, like you mentioned, Dr. Gaddis, there are people who acquired the disease who recovered, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge is, is that one, we know that recovery through HIV without intervention can prove to be fatal. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, this is a respiratory infection we're talking about, right? Um, and that HIV is a retrovirus, meaning it's literally attacking the very thing in our bodies that's designed to protect us from disease. Like HIV attacks our immune system. The COVID-19 does not do that. <laughs> and so um, that's another challenge to this process. And I think that the antibody research efforts are going to help us to, to, to find clues and answers to the questions about how to, how to do this and how to do it well in terms of developing HIV vaccine. The other consideration is, is that, it, you know, it could be that we may end up with an antibody product that could be, that could be you know, available in the market sometime in the future that actually works as a, a protection, right? That actually works as a sort of a form of PrEP. So um, that's another potential outcome of this research. And so I, I guess I, for, uh, what I, try to communicate to lay persons is that HIV, unlike COVID, mutates or changes so differently in, in each person that what it does to one person, it may do something totally different in another. So it's always ahead of the game. So as soon as you come up with a solution to one com uh, um, configuration, you, it's changed to something else and you have to create something new. And so finding that, that which is, I think you said 
uh, not silver bullet, but finding the right combination for COVID was a, just a lot easier than we've experienced with HIV. And it's frustrating, yeah. but we have to stick to the science. It is. It was much easier. And there are different. I mean, a, one person can have different strains of HIV that complicate the process. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there was another question, if I can jump. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. About uh, community, you know, what community can do to uh, bring about more dollars to address this. And, you know, all of this, ultimately what we're talking about in in. Uh, what we've been talking about is is predicated upon health policy and mm -hmm. health policy is guided by um, lawmakers. So how do we activate our communities to one, as, as Dr. Gaddis mentioned, recognize that HIV is still here. It's still impacting people. It's not just a black people's disease. It's not just a gay people's disease. It's not just a sex worker or a drug user disease that this is still something that's impacting. We're still seeing about 40,000 new cases every year in this country, but the majority of the country believes that HIV is done. So we need to put this back into the minds and hearts of people to remind them that we have not conquered this disease yet. And we need to mobilize our communities and our policymakers to respond in kind. And again, part of this response I think needs to include conversations around public-private partnerships so that industry begins to get involved in this and begin their innovation process um, because companies want to make money. So then the question comes, how can we incite companies to come into this process in a way that's going to develop innovation and move us quicker? And those of us that do the work um, and have committed our lives and careers to this work, I think there's there were being called also to go back to some of the basics. You know, I'm told that frequently of uh, that you all that sometimes they frame it like you don't do what you used to do. You know, I remember you would go here, or you would go into schools and you would go but again back to politics when when I know I started working in this arena in 85 and I guess my age is showing. Um the, the reality is, is that I had an easier time getting and connecting and educating and infiltrating systems of education in 1985 when people were hysterical and fearful um, than I can right now. What I have to do as a agency head and what my staff has to do to even engage systems at the local level and questions about revitalizing, as Dr. Wallace has indicated, this conversation that it hasn't gone away, that our school systems, our books are archaic. They are not only not addressing HIV as an infectious disease, they, they are not, PrEP is not, not even found on those pages. So the HIV treatment is not on those pages. And so we are educating decades of young people who move into the world, into colleges and into the workforce who are totally oblivious to the realities of this, including STDs. And so this whole conversation back to COVID uh, and the intersectionality, my opportunity that was given to me through COVID co-VPN, uh, the faith initiative to, to somehow rekindle these conversations, not just about COVID, but also engaging in conversations about things like HIV that people have forgotten to remind them that this still lives and that COVID is just another uh, opportunity that we have to either come together and address health disparities for people who don't have access, regardless of where they live. Um, and so it's been a blessing. And so I think that we have to go back and revitalize our conversations around HIV from a faith perspective, because we've lost it and we need to recapture it again. Dr. Gaddis, I couldn't agree with you more. And it goes back to what Dr. Um, Wallace said as well, but, you know, working with a nonprofit organization for almost 35 years mm -hmm. um, that we provide uh, housing and supportive services for people living with disabilities and HIV. But we still have to look at 
also, Dr. Wallace, that, you know, even seen with the HIV epidemic, it, we still see a, a large uh, dis, uh, disproportionate, you know, proportionate of burden with people of color uh, suffering from HIV. We still see a, you know, almost a 40 percent new HIV infection rate among African-Americans in the United States. And we only constitute less than almost 13 percent of the population. So, you know, you're looking at the disparity rate in the COVID population is still, you know, is still high among African-Americans uh, in the COVID pandemic. Um, we still, you know, the disparity rate is high. Um, my mom just died of COVID in in mm. in September, along with her roommate in a nursing facility that we're not practicing good protocol. Um, so, you know, we're learning that, you know, COVID-19, we've been able to draw on the community engagement paradigms um, that were established for HIV. And that's good. I mean, that's a, that's good that we're, we're learning from what happened with the HIV pandemic. And we're using the same protocols to make sure we don't make those same mistakes um, with COVID. And that has helped us because if it were not for HIV, we would not have some of these protocols already in place to help us in healthcare to manage, H you know, to manage COVID. We would have made some drastic, terrible healthcare mistakes, you know, double masking, doing all this, you know, doing all the things that we do on the floor uh, in healthcare today would not have been in place if it were not for HIV. I think we went overboard in HIV, but we certainly didn't go overboard since it was airborne with COVID. So we have learned a lot greatly from uh, from HIV transitioning to COVID. And I think, you know, I think that that's one thing that I can say that we've done from healthcare and from a faith-based perspective, I think it's helped us to challenge ourselves as faith leaders to be just as sensitized to COVID as we were to HIV. Um, the caring sensitive approach that I take with HIV is the same caring sensitive approach I take to COVID or anyone else that's in that situation or at a loss. Loss and do you consider loss. yourself the norm? Yeah, loss is loss. Grief mm -hmm. is grief. When you mm -hmm. lose somebody to COVID or cancer or a car wreck or a baby loss, whatever that loss is, is your personal loss. And I take it as just like when my mom died of COVID, it was just a tragic loss. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody could have done anything to prevent that loss. And they couldn't have done any more protocol differences. They couldn't have done anything else. Those caregivers had to handle her hand on hand, touch, touch, touch on touch. They had to touch her. She had to be changed. She had to be touched. So, you know, I'm not blaming the nursing home. I'm not trying to sue the nursing home, but those things had to be done a certain way. But loss is loss. And I, I wish I could have, I, I wish things could have been differently, but they were not. But you have to take a loss as a loss, just like we did in the AIDS pandemic. When the AIDS pandemic came around, we didn't know what to do. We just went into the hospital. We touched people. We kissed people. We hugged people. But in COVID, we went like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They said, oh, you can't touch. This is not the same thing. I hugged and cut and touched all of my friends during HIV and AIDS. But they told us, hey, you can't do that. So we learned from that. We learned that things are different. We have to handle things differently. But it doesn't mean that we didn't love or care for them any differently. It just means that the protocols were different, right? They were just different, mm -hmm. but you still love them. I couldn't touch my mother, but I loved her. Absolutely. And Pastor Jimmy, we do stand in mourning with you over the loss of your mother and the loss of her, her roommate. And so we do, we do acknowledge, acknowledge her spirit and we do stand, stand in mourning with you. I do want to shift. And actually, I did want to make a comment, Dr. Gaddis, as you were talking about HIV, sex education, STI education in schools, you know, it's kind of, we're in a very um, interesting, shall I say, moment of history. It, history itself, U.S. history itself is politicized. I mean, if we say the word critical race theory, 
I'm just going to leave that there. I, I never yes. thought that we would get to a point where critical race theory, critical understandings of history and just tell not even critical, just telling it like it is mm -hmm. sharing what our U.S. history has been over the last 400 years and telling the stories of of non uh, of our of our um, of, of minority populations that have been fighting, uh, fighting for liberation. Uh, in the United States, but it's at a point where that is political. So if that is political, surely sex education <laughs> is going to be even more political and more controversial. Mm -hmm. um, I do I do want to shift a little bit in thinking about, and we do have an audience question, uh, comment I want to incorporate. So, and I know some of this has been touched on, but could we use mRNA vaccine technology in the development of an, uh, of an HIV vaccine? And along with that, I want to add in a comment that says, how much science for a development of a vaccine for HIV can be used for other treatments and vaccine, vaccines for, di for diseases other than HIV? So if we think about both the mRNA te um, technology and how that might be applicable to HIV vaccines, but also HIV vaccine technology and how that might be applicable to other, other, um, other, other diseases and other health conditions. Sure. Um, we have started uh, clinical trials actually utilizing mRNA um, uh, platforms and HIV vaccines. So that's moving forward. That's one of the um, things that we've learned and pivoted uh, from in terms of our COVID-19 response. And I, my, my sense is or my feeling and belief is, is that everything that we do in science is to inform how we move forward. And so even when we conduct a trial and it may not necessarily produce the results that we had hoped, there is something to be learned and gained from that. And certainly taking those lessons learned and applying them to uh, future trials, future uh, intervention designs, um, as well as how we conduct research in other disease areas, I think is really important. So. And I also want to open it up to the panel if anyone else wanted to make a comment on this question. Again, leveraging mRNA technology for HIV vaccine technology. You know, I'm I'm a high believer in translation. So, you know, <clears throat> my my goal is typically. In, in lessons learned. And so people uh, in the community, when they're even deciding about whether they wanna be vaccinated or not, they're, lo um, they're looking at black and white. And so they'll look at not to, to minimize the impact of people who have uh, been impacted by the vaccine as an outcome. They'll take that uh, a, a smaller group of people when compared to millions of people who have successfully been vaccinated and who are surviving and, and moving through this pandemic. And they'll focus on those few and try to reflect it on the broader decision whether they should choose to be vaccinated or not. And so um, Scientifically, there's certain folks that are drawn to the conversations around mRNA vaccines and what we've learned and what the future and the past have been with those. I try to stick more to the basics of what those are, how they impact your decision to get vaccinated or not, and to reinforce that mRNA vaccines, as it relates to COVID, have been confirmed in, in millions of people as one of the only uh, strategies we have to prevent someone from, um, from acquisition and or uh, severe illness. 
and certainly um, preventing them from ending up dead. It's, it's literally self uh, preservation for, for so many uh, because of these mRNA vaccines. Absolutely. I do thank everyone for their patience. I know we may just have had a little technical difficulty with the with the screen freezing, but we are in this COVID-19 virtual environment, which allows all of us to be together from all around the world. But we do thank you for your patience because we know that technical difficulties can occur as we as we shift. You know, I do want to be um, aware of our timing. I do want to shift to one of our next questions. So how important is an HIV vaccine to ending the epidemic? Do we do we need an HIV vaccine? Is is this was this what's most important right now? What we need to be focusing our attention on? Maybe an HIV model of the Operation Warp Speed, or it, or is something else more important? Doctor Gaddis, I'm. I'm seeing your face. Well, I'm just, there's some pieces of me that feel like we're back in the eighties. So that's what, that's where my struggle is, you know, that we've worked so hard trying to, I mean, science has catapulted us into life with treatment and prep and all of these innovations, but the politics have not kept up to speed with the medical innovations. Um, uh, criminal justice systems have not kept up with innovations and uh, of science around HIV. And so day to day, we, I still feel some level of frustration, whether it's education and criminal justice, social justice platforms, where we're still trying to translate that we have made all of these successes, but they're you're creating barriers to us getting this information to who it needs to be, uh, who it needs to be presented to, uh, um, and into our communities, whether it's youth, um, adults, and, and those who just um, live everyday lives wherever they may be. Dr. Gaddis, I, I, couldn't agree with you more. Well, how, I don't know how we're going to end the epidemic when we still are facing these traditional struggles. I guess that's why I'm shaking my head. I agree, I, Dr. Gaddis, I couldn't agree with you more. We could, I think we keep putting band-aids on it. The, uh, 2021 marks the 40th year uh, since the first reported case of AIDS. And I think we, we're, we're putting band-aids on the situation. We put band-aids <laughs> on it by giving it prep. We put band-aids on it by giving it all of these cocktails out here. So the average well, thank God for the cocktails. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. And now we've gone from taking twelve to fourteen cocktails a day, and we've got it down to you take one or two pills a day, and you're and you don't feel as sick. You you don't have to you don't have to take anything for nausea. You don't have to take anything for not feeling too good. You're, we've got it down to a science other than a cure. So we've got all of these other things in our toolbox to make you feel good, to make you feel better, but we haven't cured you. We haven't done anything for cure. And so what's happened to cure research? And this is for me, the community liaison, the community person. Um, I'm an RN by training. No one really knows that because I don't practice as an RN anymore. I got it years and years and years ago, back in the eighties, but I never practiced with it. Um, but I look at it today and I said, you know, what could I have done to make a big difference if I had my RN? What could I have done any different after my RN training? I've always been a community activist, but I've never been a rah rah. -er. But I'm looking at it today and looking at both of you who've been engaged in research, been engaged totally in research for years and years and years, and Delara, and I'm saying we have not come that far in 40 years. We have not. And I, I, I do want to ask, you know, we do have these um, prevention strategies. We have treatment as prevention. And as you're talking about, you know, folks taking medications and ARTs, you know, we are at the point of uh, where the science is advanced to undetectable being untransmittable. So we do have 
we do have some biomedical strategies, right? We're talking about prep that we have long acting cabotegravir that's a that's about to you know come online. So we do have some behavioral tools, we have some biomedical tools, and we do have some um, coordination and funding with the ending the HIV epidemic uh, um, kind of um, uh, initiative that started a couple years ago from. The prior administration, and so, and that's been sustained with uh, with current President uh, Biden. Um, so, so, so the things that that everyone is here talking about the 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 money piece, right? The the so we can talk about resources, but then we can also talk about dollars, right? So people need dollars to to make research move forward. So we we have that. We have the coordination because we have this major federal initiative as far as ending the HIV epidemic and there's coordination across federal agencies, institutions, CFARs, um, AIDS research centers, et cetera. So we we have that. And then we also have some of these biomedical tools, you know, in our toolbox. So why I guess I, I want to kind of push back and say we have all of this and even though they're they're you know there there is a you know politics that that is that is involved and you know we know there's some there are there's some there's some other contextual issues at play i want to push back because we some of these things we we have not we really haven't had we haven't had this level of federal attention to hiv in years um so wh why are we still here I, I, would, I, I would like to offer a frame to your question um, I think that we have done amazing work in the last two decades regarding HIV. Um, HIV Prevention Trials Network Study 052 was the landmark study that got us the understanding that if you initiate antiretroviral treatment early, that you're less likely to uh, transmit HIV to your sexual partner. Uh, that's how we ended up with the moniker U equals U. Um, and certainly there's been advances in, 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 in PrEP. Um, we started out with just Trubata. We now have Descovy. And soon we will have injectable forms of PrEP. Um, and I think about the, the, the coordination work, you know, all the work that's happening within health centers to make them more accessible. Um, there is work that's happening. There's work that's happening to diversify the healthcare industry and the workforce. Uh, Morehouse School of Medicine and other uh, HBCU medical schools are, you know, doing their part to produce black and brown physicians to enter the workforce to uh, to help to do this, and and also to help mitigate the the, the challenges that exist from black and brown communities not having historical access to to care and what that has meant. I do want to offer, um, in addition to the advances that we have had to respond to HIV, that uh, I do believe that an HIV vaccine is critical to ending the epidemic, that it is a vaccine that will uh, get us back to some normalcy. I believe a vaccine will also help to reduce stigma uh, I also believe that uh, having a vaccine will will help to have people in a place where they can engage people without having to think about HIV. Um, and that is a goal for many of us. But I also want to recognize um, that, you know, my colleagues have talked about the Band-Aids, um, you know, in this situation, and, and you mentioned it as well. And I, I think that while we've made significant advances, and this has been on the backs of study participants and, and communities who have volunteered for studies and who are you know, engaged in this work and, and researchers, et cetera, that, that addressing the, the pathogen that is HIV without addressing the social and structural factors that influence it permeating our communities will mean that um, that this will not be the last epidemic that we experience and that future epidemics might actually hit us harder um, because we, I, I think a bit, you know, <laughs> I, I remember Bible 
study. I remember going through some seminary training and thinking about how God puts you in situations for you to learn a lesson. And baby, if you don't get that lesson, God will put you in the same situation to try to learn it again. It may look a little different, but the goal is for you to learn this lesson. And I believe that as a nation, as a people, we have an opportunity to learn the lesson so that we do not have to repeat it. Mm-hmm. And it is upon it is incumbent upon us to learn the lesson uh, so that future generations don't have to experience an HIV epidemic or something similar. So in in and I and there was a, there are a couple of audience questions or comments um, and saying yes, but that only works. Uh, I'm guessing here the therapies only work um, as long as there's medication available, right? Mm-hmm. And again, we are currently seeing efforts to now again create waiting lists for medications in states that have been without yeah. waiting lists for decades. Yeah. Uh, so I do I do want to thank Eddie Givens for those. For those uh, for those comments, and again, while there are these medication assistance programs, there are still a great uh, deal of barriers. So, um, Dr. Gaddis, did you I, want I to just join want to in? Make sure that um, I don't fall victim to groupthink, and that is is that I never want to forget that the folks that I'm meeting, it's Southern folks that I'm meeting when I engage them in just basic uh, barbershop conversation, just simply asking them, do they know what U equals U means? They don't have a clue. And so the silo that I struggle to, to, to stay out of is that one where I meet with my colleagues that we all speak the same language that we we understand the science and the and the innovation and the toolkit, but the folks out there that we're trying to get to, um, we have to translate to them as soon as possible. Um, you know this the fact that we have this major uh, reduction in people seeking vaccinations right now is really disturbing to me. We're do we we're going to great lengths. Um, to to try to continue, but the folks that I talk to don't watch CNN, they don't watch MSNBC, and if we don't, but yet we we know face to face, we know that certain kinds of modalities are the best strategies to reach certain folks, um, but yet we have political leadership who are who have set mandates. You will not wear mask on the school bus. You will not go door to door to incentive and or you will not incentivize anyone because it's seen as coercion. And so I just want to make sure I focus on who it is I'm talking to as I speak to these innovations that that we're all uh, proclaiming uh, will end the epidemic. But somehow we're still have to overcome these hurdles of getting to the common man, if you will, or the everyday man on the street. I would also like to offer that. um, I I don't think that biomedical advances by themselves will eliminate any of the pandemics, whether that's HIV or COVID-19 that we really need um, to do the work, as I mentioned before, like these are strategies that can help mitigate the impact. Um, and, and certainly having an HIV vaccine, like having a COVID-19 vaccine um, will help decrease the impact um, of this pandemic on communities. But we, we have got to change how we think, talk and engage uh, systems that construct health policy, that construct um, Uh, our environments, our neighborhoods. I think about the way that environmental racism is running rampant in black and brown communities, particularly in the US South, where you can drive literally within five, 10 minutes and and run across five or six, maybe even sometimes in upwards of 10 liquor stores, but not very many grocery stores. 
And so, or, or health centers for that matter. Or pharmacies. Okay. Or pharmacies. So this is, this is, this is how policy um, and, and, and racism intertwine to perpetuate the health disparities that we continue to see and, and face. And vaccines can't, vaccines can't resolve that. Jimmy, you are muted. You're muted, Jimmy. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Remember Dr. Gaddis and, and Dr. Wallace when we had feet on the ground, when we started passing out condoms years ago? I worked for the health department. We went to the club. <laughs> we passed out condoms. We said, use these condoms. But that was when those efforts were there. There was money. And all of us worked at night. We are not we, funding we, that anymore. Exactly. We were all working at night. We we slept during the day and we on Saturdays. And we still. Yeah. And that's what and that's what I think Dr. Wallace is alluding to. You've got to put feet on the ground in order to make an impact. Well, you still got to put feet on the ground. People have got to see your face. They've got to touch your hand. They've got to see it to believe it. And if you don't do those kinds of things still, people won't believe it. Like you said, Dr. Gaddis, our folks are not watching CNN. They're not watching these cable news shows. They're not even watching NBC, CBS, or ABC. They're watching Netflix, Hulu, and all of these other um, other things that do not feature these types of um, programming. They want to see people on the street. They want to see you. And if until they see people that look like us and people that act like us, they don't believe us. Well, and let me just note that there are, you know, the other side of the coin is that those of us that look like us and have a identity that reflects the people we're trying to serve, uh, we are a dying breed. And so we are we are clearly uh, upfitting our funding and directing funding to uh somewhat more medical model strategies, which I mean, personally, I don't, in the beginnings of my work in the field in 85, we had a strictly medical model. It didn't work then. And I'm not sure translating it to back to a medical model totally is going to be the answer either. It's a, it's a unique combination of both medical and what we've all reinforced here, which is to say boots on the ground, getting back in those neighborhoods, mm -hmm. door to door, whatever we have to do to revitalize the conversation. You're exactly right. But, you know, it can't be someone my age. I used to think that I was young enough to do that. But now that I realize that I just turned 59, I, I, I don't have that pretty look well, anymore. We should have and been I training the next generation. Exactly. But, you know, those folks that are coming behind me, they're not as interested in that. So we're going to have to, like, reinvigorate ourselves or make make science or make this work interesting. Because on my boards, they all are my age or older. So it's like, you know, how do you get someone Stefan's age or Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Wallace's age or younger to get interested in doing the work that we do so that they'll be how old ready to do it? How old are you, Dr. Wallace? You know, that's the best, the biggest kept secret. Yeah, it is. But I mean, we really got to engage. <laughs> but we really got to engage younger, the younger generation. I'm talking about 40 back, so that we can get them to do the boots on the ground to entice the younger generation that can really move this mountain that we're talking about. Because it's not going to take these 60 year olds like me. They're not. If they see me coming to the club passing out condoms, they're going to say, "Who's this dirty old man?" So we've got to really move this um, mountain and start doing the work that we're called to do. And I say it every time on the NCCC as the national secretary, we are called to do this work. This is important work. This is godly work. And we're called to do it or we would not be on this call. People would not be listening. People would not be engaged to do this work. Not everything is done out of the pulpit. We're called to do this work from the streets. We're called to do it in our science labs. We're called to do this work because it's community engagement. We're called to do this work because 
a higher power has called us to do it. And we're going to do it until God calls us home or until your higher power calls you home. This is this this is what we are called to do. And we're challenged to do it correctly. And we're challenged to do it the right way. And I think that all of us are doing it the way that we think is the best way to do it. And I'm just happy that we're all on this call doing it the way we think that God has called us to do it. I do. Um, I know we have we, it's, we're having such an invigorating uh, conversation, but I do want to be mindful of the time. And I did want to shift to one of our next questions, which is how have other medical advances in HIV affected the development of an HIV vaccine? And here I really wanted to bring up something that, you know, was kind of in the um, popular press. I believe last year, 20, yes, 2020, in March of 2020, about the London patient. So, you know, there there were articles in the Lancet and there were articles all around uh, the, the world news about this London patient who had a bone marrow transplant and um, and he was said to be cured, quote unquote, of, of HIV. So and had at that time been uh, virus free for 30 months. Uh, and that was last year. So I'm wondering, is the vaccine technology the direction that we need to be moving for, forward um, in or advancing? Or do we need to be looking at other kinds of technologies like what has happened with this London, what happened with one of the London patients and the advancement of, of this bone marrow uh, transplant? And I also want to uh, and I, I'm looking at you, Dr. Wiles, as we're thinking about this, I want you to talk a little bit about the cost of, you know, what, it, you know, what, um, what the intervention, what the, what the treatment for the London patient costs as, as, as we think about the difference between that and maybe vaccines or maybe some other kind of medical advancement that we may not be aware of, or even something like the CRISPR technology. I've, I've heard, um, I've you know read art articles in the popular press about that. So is the direction really uh, that we need to be moving in in vaccine technology or do we need to be looking at, you know, bone marrow transplants or CRISPR genetic stuff? Do we, what do we, what, what do you think? Well, I think we're talking about sort of the difference between a preventative HIV vaccine versus uh, cure research. And I think that both are important. Um, you know, scaling up bone marrow transplants uh, to, to a population level uh, rollout is, is, I don't think that that's possible, um, nor is it efficient. Um, no one, you know, would want to, who wants to go through the process of a bone marrow transplant uh, to to rid HIV from their body, um, and and given that many people who go through that process don't actually ever fully recover uh, in ways that give them uh, a, a decent quality of life, and the other thing I will say about that is is that you know there is work that's being done to to look at um, editing the CCR5 receptor, which is the receptor on our uh, on our immune cells that HIV can attach to. Um, so that research is happening, and and that specifically looking at it from the the, the from the cure or functional cure perspective, um, and then of course there's there's still uh, an important cons consideration there for HIV vaccines. I think um, the the cure agenda and the HIV preventive uh, agenda uh, share some you know commonalities and some uh, so there, there's some relationship there. I think. Um, the other thing I will mention is, is in terms of cost, one of the things that we've been talking about here lately, I would say lately is in the last 18 months uh, to, to two and a half years or so, is that uh, scaling or, or conducting HIV vaccine trials, um, efficacy trials, is uh, proving to be more complicated with the advancement of um, other biomedical tools like PrEP. And so part of the, the ethical commitment uh, when we think about how, to, how do we design our trials is to ensure that we're offering the standard of care. And if we're offering the standard of care, which currently is oral prep, in addition to other you know, tools like condoms, you know, count, prevention counseling, et cetera, do we 
need to think about increasing the sample size of our studies, which increases the cost, right? Or, or um, in order to, because uh, effectively we need to conduct a study to be able to detect whether there's a difference between people who received the vaccine versus people who didn't. And if everyone in the community is using PrEP or is, is uh, in terms of a pre prevention approach, then how likely we would be able to see that difference? And so there's, there's considerations there with cost, there's considerations there with ethics, there's considerations there with um, how to design trials that more effectively uh, reach end goals or, or targets. The other consideration is that, and this is part of what we've been talking about lately, is whether we need to look at other things besides you know, clinical endpoints in the study. And for those who may not be aware, what we're looking for in HIV prevention studies is how many people seroconvert. Um, and so do we need to look at other, are there other metrics or other factors that we need to be considering that we can look to as a marker of whether or not this particular intervention works besides that particular endpoint? You know, do we look at, as an example, um, the incidence of HIV in the community? Um, do we, do we, you know, do pretests, you know, before people come into the trial? Like, what are the other sort of strategies and options that we might be able to utilize that don't completely like drive up the cost <laughs> of conducting studies? Because um, they're already extremely expensive to conduct, uh, especially uh, multi site and multinational um, studies. So. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. And we are getting uh, a handful of comments in the chat about vaccines in developing nations and that being more cost effective than treatment. Comments around comprehensive mentorship programs. We're getting some amens. We are called to do this work. Yes. As we are wrapping up, I do want to turn to our last question, which is how do we build trust, diversity in research and equity and outcomes around HIV technologies. So I do want to provide all of our panelists an opportunity to to use this uh, as our as our closing uh, discussion point and discussion question. And do feel free to broaden that that um, that question discussion point out. So I do want to start with Dr. Gaddis, if that's OK. And I know, Dr. Gaddis, um, you've been doing some work with young folks and I, we would love for you to Kind of talk about some of that and also talk about this kind of trust building and also thinking about diversity not only in terms of a racial or 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 gender or in terms of ethnic diversity but also in 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 um in age so i, I would we would love to hear hear more from you well i and yeah, and i'll be brief um since this is somewhat divergent um but you know one of the first things i would say in short is where I actually started, which is um, this whole issue around stigma. Um, wh what strategies do we need to continue to put this in play? Because even within young people that we're meeting, uh, sp particularly uh, young people of color, we're, this same stigma and, and some nuances of discrimination around people living with HIV uh, is still seems to be relevant. Um, there are lessons learned uh, from COVID um, among young people who have had COVID or their parents or have had multiple family members um, contract COVID or even uh, pass away from COVID. They still have, are, when you ask them about their reasons for not being vaccinated, uh, many still believe that they were immune because they had COVID and they still have antibodies, which we know uh, have their own uh, life of their own. And we still are looking at that. How long is it that they last? Um, some of the young people were scared. They talked about being guinea pigs. Um, uh, they, they haven't had COVID yet and they weren't worried about it. So looking at how how do we increase their, not just their education and awareness, but how do we have them revisit their level of vulnerability? And so when I think about how do we build trust, number one, we have to engage young people in this conversation much earlier um, and in the ways that they understand it. Um, I want to make a final statement about 
um, black men. Um, you know, we we already affirmed that young gay men of color, young black men are highly vulnerable to HIV. Well, in fact, no one has really focused or talked about the impact that COVID has had on, on black men and all of the men that we have lost that no one talks about who were in their third, tw uh, tw late 20s, 30s, and 40s. The, the same black men who left children and partners and households behind. And so I want to reinforce in building trust. And this has come from my HIV uh, grassroots work. And more recently, certainly from COVID work, um, we need to make a, as a priority, um, an emphasis to focus on black men, to engage them in ways that they get it, to go to places where they are and find out what their attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge is and, and recruit and engage them to help us in this fight. Because I just happen to believe that they're instrumental, not only from a reproductive perspective, but they're instrumental in how we address HIV and most certainly how we address COVID in the future and, and whether we'll get to the vaccine space. But we need them in this conversation. And so I would end on saying that Translation is everything. How we translate to community has everything to do with how we build trust, how we increase uh, uh, participation in research, and, and how we make sure that equity is there across gender and race. Thank you, Dr. Gaddis. And could you tell us a little bit about turning up or tuning out? We wanted uh, to post that link and share that link with our audience, but can you tell us a little yeah, bit more I, about I, what that is? Yeah, I put it in the chat. It's a survey that we're asking young folks, uh, especially high school students, young adults who might just be entering college. Um, um, I put the uh, survey in the link. We've actually linked a hundred dollar raffle opportunity to that survey. We're just really wanting to interface with young people, find out what they think, what their personal experiences have been with COVID. Um, uh, and and one of the things that I, uh, was really interesting to me in 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 the outcomes that we got from a, a small cohort of of high school students was most folks forgot that we've all been vaccinated. We've been vaccinated for polio, for smallpox, and all kinds of other um, uh, uh, diphtheria and and all of these other things, but we forgot. So vaccines are not new. And so tuning up, turn, uh, turning up or, and, or tuning out is really just a vernacular that, I, that we've put forth to ask young people to engage, tell us what you know, but to help me engage uh, you in conversation of how do we change how they're thinking about vaccines and what do we need to do to save the next generation? Because this is really about saving lives. So if there's folks on here that know some young folks who would um, um, uh, fill out the survey, um, tune, uh, turn it, uh, turning up or tuning out, we would really ask you to sh share it with whomever you wish um, so that we can come back maybe at another time and share some of the outcomes of what we've learned from these young folks. Thank you, Dr. Gaddis. And we're going to have a uh, Pastor Jimmy coming on next. And we, we do ha just have a few minutes to wrap up. So uh, I will just ask us all to be um, cognizant of the time because we do want to have some closing remarks. Thank you. Very quickly. Um, every conversation that I have and that we should have, we should consider them very sacred and that we should consider them important. We should practice our listening skills because everyone has a reason why they do things. We engage people because we want something from them, but we want to listen to them. So as we engage the work that we do, remember that we're going to be mindful that they have reasons why they want to do something and why we want to get them to do something. And so it's a give and take relationship. And this is what I remember every time I go out and do ministry. There's a part of me that wants to receive and there's a part of me that wants to give. And this is what we're called to do. Thank you. 
Thank you. And we will have closing remarks from Dr. Wallace. Sure. Um, I think it's really important that we continue to do the work as our colleagues have described, intentionally making and creating opportunities to bring people along in the process, not just in terms of uh, being consumers of the information, the products, the services that we may provide, but also in terms of leadership development uh, and sustainability of our organizations that have been committed to doing this work for years, uh, as well as the young people that are out there who are developing new organizations, creating new uh, opportunities and new structures to support uh, advancing our health, our wellness, and how we navigate this uh, complicated and racist uh, society. HIV is a critical disease that uh, needs to be put back into the consciousness and the hearts and minds of the American people. And HIV vaccine research, in addition to all biomedical HIV research, uh, is critical to moving us forward. But as I mentioned before, we cannot forget about how the systems that are constructed around us also influence our health uh, through policies, uh, through systems. And so it is incumbent upon us to think critically about how we also uh, work to change, modify, and dismantle those systems that do not work in our favor and put up new systems that will ensure um, that all of our uh, access, all of our uh, uh, needs regarding health and wellness are met and addressed and that we can live full and whole lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I did at this time want to bring up Elder George Kerr and welcome him as he closes us out, begins to close us out. Uh, before I do my closing remarks. I just want to say a big thank you to our panelists. I mean, this was absolutely amazing job by all. And when we started this conversation about two months ago on what it was going to look like, I had no idea that it was going to be this informative. So I just want to th say thank you. Can we bring up our partnership slide? The next one. Okay. The committee, uh, the Inter CIFAR HIV, <coughs> uh, Inter CIFAR Faith Spirituality Research and the Faith Coalition, US HIV AIDS Faith Coalition, want to thank everyone as this was a joint effort to make this happen today. And on the uh, slide, you will see the uh, six members that are show up every. Uh, it's been every week, and we're going to push it out a little further now, um, every other two weeks, I think, um, meeting to bring these incredible webinars to you. And so I just want to say a big thank you to everyone involved. Robin? Uh, co-director of the Behavioral and Community Sciences Corps with the Center for AIDS Research. And I just echo uh, Elder George Kerr's sentiments and everyone on the committee um, and with great appreciation for our panelists and our moderator and the work that you're doing and how we can all collaborate together and uh, bring forward great, great work. And so thank you all. And if we can just show that last slide, we just want to encourage everyone to stay in touch with us, the UAB CIFAR Behavioral and Community Sciences Corps. And we are on all of all, we are on all of everything. We just need to get a TikTok. I'm looking at you, Dr. Lanzi, to get us going on TikTok since we're talking about young people, engaging young people, but we are <laughs> We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So do continue to engage with us.
And all of I will thank you for uh, bringing that up. And all of our previous webinars are also uh, stored on our YouTube channel, so please visit there if you would like to see our previous ones. And um, we welcome you sharing your ideas for future webinars as well. And so thankful for this collaborative uh, webinar and co-sponsorship. Have a great day.